Anurag has like multiple decades of experience. So feel free yeah. to throw any question uh, in the chat. Doesn't matter the scope or the domain or the expertise, etc. Right? Game dev, esports, gaming, players, popularity, marketing, whatever. <laughs> Just throw. It I, I, I'll try to answer best of my knowledge. But that's yeah, the only yeah. only caveat. Yeah, perfect, perfect. I think that's that's what everybody expects. So, all right, cool. I think Pish, good, right? Good to go. Yep, awesome. All right, perfect, awesome. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Mayank Grover. I'm the founder of Outscale. Um, today we have a very special guest, Anurag. Um, I think one of the few times where I get to talk to people who have spent almost like a decade more than I have in this industry. And that's always a good sort of a learning uh, experience for me. And I look forward to a lot of these kind of conversations. So Anurag, uh, welcome. And, and thank you so much for taking out the time. Um, any quick words that you want to just throw out and say hello to the audience? Thanks, man. Really, really honored to be on uh, the other side of uh, podium. I, I love <laughs> interacting with people, sharing my knowledge and sharing my experience. And best day if people can, any even if iota of that, they can use it. It, it makes me feel happy. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, just a little bit, Anurag has worked uh, for the last 20 plus years in the gaming industries on a lot of different sites. He was with PDM Games. He was with um, uh, Rockstar India for a while. He was, uh, sorry, not Rockstar, um, uh, Riot Games. Both ours got mixed in my head. <laughs> and now uh, Anurag is leading his own venture, Nugent Gaming. So Anurag, if you can uh, give us a little bit taste of what Nugent Gaming is, what the mission is, and, and how you're trying to sort of um, you know, bring esports to the Indian audience, right? So, what's the broader perspective there? So, uh, Nugen Gaming, our brand for esports is Penta Esports, mm -hmm. the one you see in behind me. Right. The whole objective of uh, setting up uh, Penta Esports was to democratize and legitimize esports in India. With that mm -hmm. being said, our vision is to be the key of everything esports providing opportunity to gaming talent and discovering new titles. Because the if you look at the trends today, when it comes to esports, it's generally the most popular game which are in the picture. Games like Valorant, PUBG mm -hmm. Mobile, uh, sorry, BGMI, Free Fire, but there's no mention of any other title. So under our amateur league, we are covering 12 titles across the year. So that is the whole idea. Plus, we are also creating the content which is consumed by not just the hardcore esports players, but more by all 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 gamers, to be more precise. So in that case, like, are you actually going out and discovering new games that you feel are really sort of esports worthy and maybe yes. they just didn't get that podium to showcase? So how are you going about this search and discovery kind of process? So what we, we do, so like we have a league called Penta uh, MHA League where mm -hmm. it's only a league where you have a prize pool of monthly five uh, lakhs. And uh, depending on the popularity, it generally has one or two titles every month. And uh, none of the pro players are allowed to participate in that. Like anybody who is celebrated by any sports organization is not allowed to participate. So mm -hmm. with that being said, the first, uh, we launched it in October. The October, we launched it for two games. One is uh, uh, WCC3. Next uh, Waves uh, World Cricket Championship. Another game was actually a game for PS4 and 5. Hmm. GT, uh, GT Sport. If you look at GT Sport, doesn't have any esports scene in India. So hmm. we went out, launched uh, GT Sport uh, tournament in India, and we saw very good uh, response. Of course, in MHL League, we are covering the popular games right now. The broadcast for uh, Free Fire tournament is going on in MHL League only. We have covered uh, BGMI, we have covered uh, even uh, Valorant, but mm -hmm. next month we are even covering Pokemon Unite. So we go out, look for titles which are not even popular in India, but they are esports uh, worthy titles and we mm -hmm. do a monthly tournament around them. So are you, uh, when you think about the audience of your titles that you're looking to launch, right, to the mm -hmm. Indian consumers, right? Like, yeah. uh, like, is there a target persona in your mind that that like your viewership and player base would come from like say the college audience or some specific sectors or states or geographies like how are you sort of mapping out where you see the customer base originating so uh, this is a thing which i learned back in 2001 which is my initial years of gaming uh, giving my small background i got into gaming in 99 
I was the third person in the country to get into Indian gaming scene, along with Vishal Gonda from India Game and mm-hmm. Rajesh Shaw from Dhuva. And we all started in 98, 99. I was the youngest at that time in 99. But uh, in 2001, we were part of uh, Reliance Infocom. Mm-hmm. That's where I learned that India is not just Metro's man. Mm-hmm. India is all tier two and tier three cities. If you look at it and that, even you look at Reliance's today's ecosystem, it's based out of tier two, tier three, and of course, Metro's. Yeah. So even for us, that is the whole thing that even the players and the viewers are mainly coming from tier two, tier three cities. Mm-hmm. Reason being, they have much more disposable time at mm-hmm. uh, their hands and income and everything else. So but they yeah. like to enjoy mm-hmm. gaming much more than the kids in the metros. Because if you have to get the, of course, today is a COVID situation. So I am presuming that nobody is going out. But if we... In the earlier situation, non-COVID uh, times, if you have to get attention of a kid in the metro, it was very tough because he has so many entertainment options, hmm. so many multiplexes, so many uh, places to hang out, etc. But kid in a tier two, tier three city doesn't have that many options. So generally, the audience, viewers, and both player base is coming from tier two, tier three cities only. But then, course, I, yeah. like, yeah, that was I was my my intrigue. I said the question that I was about to ask was like, is are you seeing both the players and the viewers yes. coming from tier three, yes. which you answered yes. in the last statement? Yes, point. yes, yes. Because that is that is where India is, man. Hmm. That hmm. is where real India is. Though hmm. I would love to actually go into tier four and below cities also, but hmm. right now majority of our uh, player base and viewership is coming from tier two and tier three cities. Okay, got it. So in that case, like, how are you, like, uh, are you giving even uh, opportunities to young budding players to bubble up the ranks, etc. Yes. in like the amateur league that you mentioned? Yes, yes and- that, that is the whole idea. We So it was easy for us if we were only running after viewership, it was easy for us to mix amateur to the players and uh, professional players. Mm-hmm. But we are very clear, we want to give opportunity to amateur players only that's the only reason why only amateur and semi pros can participate in our uh, leagues so hmm. it's open tournament no entry fees of course being esports we don't i am totally against charging entry fees for uh, the tournaments and anybody can participate provided there is an age restriction which is set up by the game itself like generally it is anything from 13 to 18 hmm. is the minimum age which we adhere to and that's the only restriction we have. Okay, got it, got it. And and normally from a more business standpoint, right? I know the even within our outscale community, there are a lot of people who are thinking, yeah, I'll do my own game studio someday. I'll start building my own indie games as well. So a slightly business focused question would be like, how are you thinking about the business model? Where does the revenue eventually flow from? Because on the one side, you're letting a lot of players come in without entry ticket itself, because that's at least from what I understand, a lot of esports kind of function in that way where they conduct tournaments and then they have these participation tickets and then the pool price gets distributed to the winners and the company takes a cut as well. Like like the classic casino model where you Mm. take some rake and then redistribute the other prices. Generally, 90% of the publishers don't allow the tournament operators, that's what we are, to charge money for participation because Mm. it's it's a model where the, they give the license free to conduct the tournament, but mm. with a very clear jurisdiction that you can't charge the players for entry fee. For a right. very simple reason, because for all the publishers, esports is one of the best way to market their games. Mm. More people, new players come to see what that game is all about, the kind of people are playing, and that's the reason why more people start playing it, and of course, percentage of that players do in-app. So mm. that is on the publisher side. So for us, the major source of revenue is the brand sponsorships. Mm. Okay, interesting. Like mm. any traditional uh, marketing uh, company, it's oh, of course there are five uh, revenue streams for esports: brand sponsorship, advertisement, which I combine into one only right now. Mm. Third is the media rights. Hmm. Like we have done a tournament for Facebook where Facebook has paid up money, but that was only uh, available on Facebook uh, gaming platform. That's the third one. Fourth Hmm. is merchandise, selling Hmm. merchandise, which we are not doing right now. And fifth is uh, charging uh, tickets for viewing. So Hmm. these are the five revenue streams for any esports uh, uh, TO. 
the last one the ticket prices would only sort of come into play when you're doing some kind of physical events or are yes. you seeing like yes. online models also adopt no, this kind of no, approach no no, right? no 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 online i would imagine that the revenue stream shifts to sort of ad revenue yes it's it's all about revenue. sponsorship and ad revenues yeah Hmm, got it. But how do you see this um, landscape sort of shaping up? Like as people start to think about the kind of games that they want to build and the companies that they want to be, be, work for, right? Are you seeing, um, you know, uh, from an industry perspective, companies cater to games that are esports specific? I think once we understand that, probably we can dive into a little bit of how can companies and developers think about making games that are esports specific. So, sure. are you seeing that pattern kind of happen? Yes, that is happening uh, very much in India. Uh, again, going back to my uh, journey when I started the gaming company in '99, I had to literally go to my employees' house to convince them to let let their kids work in the company. Like so many people ask me, okay, he's gonna work for you, but what is the work he gonna do? Are you actually paying him to play the games? I said, no, man. We are uh, paying him to for him to make the game. He said, that's okay, but what are you paying him for? So. Coming from that background, if you look at today's industry, I think they are at that time, since I was the third in the country to start, you could just take a, you could count the people uh, employed in the gaming industry back in 99. We were like 40, 50 young kids who were part of that gaming industry in mm -hmm. three companies back in 99. Today, I think wild guess would be something like five to 10K at least in all mm -hmm. the major studios. And mm -hmm. these are studios who are developing game. These are not the studios who are doing uh, third party outsource work. Now, if you add that, then this number is uh, out of the place. Yeah. But there's a major shift in the mindset. Today, I am sure a parent is very happy that his son is working in a gaming company rather mm -hmm. than working in any traditional job. Mm -hmm. So that is how the things have uh, changed from that time to this time. Yeah, absolutely. But then are you seeing on the game company side, are you seeing companies evolve their strategy to say that, yeah, we have to produce something that's esports worthy or yes. targeted towards esports spectrum. So like if you can share some examples as well. Like uh, just, just two days back, I know of this company called uh, Super Gaming who mm -hmm. have announced the Battle Royale game. Battle Royale games traditionally are multiplayer and are uh, esports ready. Mm -hmm. So a lot of companies are getting into that. Even... Uh, MPL had announced uh, one of their games uh, as a battle royale game. Then Encore has announced uh, Foggy, which is a multiplayer game. So a lot of companies are creating this uh, esports ready games. Even uh, our friend uh, Encore has released a cricket game, which is esports ready. They have an esports mm -hmm. mode inside the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is the interesting bit, right? Like companies kind of tweaking the design it's element of the games to make them esports specific. Yeah. And and it's funny that you mentioned Super Gaming because yesterday only I was talking to Sanket, uh, who's yeah. one of the co-founders. <laughs> yes, and, I know Sanket very well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we were, we were on a call yesterday or a day before yesterday. And, and we were talking about talent and he was like, yeah, it's so hard to find good talent in India because of this new game that they're announced. And these yeah. are like mega massive projects that yeah. they're putting capital slash resources behind. Yeah. And they want to find like really kick-ass people who understands the ecosystem, who understands the, the game development scenario and can think from like a viewer perspective, from a developer perspective, exactly. from a player perspective. So there are these kind of different personas that make it very sure. interesting. I, I completely well. agree with Sanket. So me and Sanket have been dis discussing uh, this project for the last three months, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, so uh, Piyush has a question and it's an interesting one that I'll pick it up. Uh, so how do you look at this whole sort of play and earn ecosystem that's coming up within the blockchain space? Yeah. What's your take on that? Uh, okay, it, it sounds very exciting to me. A mm -hmm. lot of options. Like I'm a very big proponent of NFTs in the industry. Not so much about crypto gaming, blockchain mm -hmm. gaming, but NFTs I'm personally very excited about because it gives unique ownership of an asset to yeah. me, which yeah. if we look at it, we have been doing this in gaming for last 30 years, actually hmm. with second life launch. That was the first metaverse game, by the way, hmm. not, not Fortnite. People know Fortnite, but second life was the first uh, yeah. metaverse game and owning rights because in second life, I remember uh, back 20 years back, there was a land which was sold for $10,000 or something in a virtual game. So, hmm. That has been happening, but uh, play to earn, I think I'm waiting for 
more maturity mm. right now on the product side because i think a lot of people lot of titles that i've seen are more of very low production quality mm. right now which are called play to earn uh, and play to earn business has been never official but has been on since uh, 2007 because first discussion i had was in 2007 with a friend of mine who said yaar yeah, in china you see these guys all these kids are playing getting the level of the characters up and then selling it which selling is it, yeah. actually what played to earn is exactly like these were they were like these shadow secondary economies that exist yes right? yes especially yes. i remember early in the days you would get these uh, um, you know uh, trade requests that i'm selling uh, like a world of warcraft account Correct. level yep. 90 maxed out level blah yes. blah blah and this is like 500 dollars us right exactly exactly and people would buy it right no, like because like who wants to spend people, like six months i used to play a game called everquest i had a mm-hmm. max level uh, guardian on our server in everquest and when i left the game i got five people request that hey man can, would you like to sell that character to us i said no ma'am I am not selling it. I just was playing for the fun. And now I'm giving up. He said, "No, no, we will keep it alive. Please sell it to us. This yeah. is the amount." And we, were, I was offered like two hundred dollars there in two thousand four or five to sell that character. But I didn't. That's a different story. A but this has been happening day, unofficially. <laughs> but now it's official. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um, it, like it, I am especially excited about. Uh, like I completely agree with what you said regarding maturity. i'm mm-hmm. seeing like uh, you know you have the the hearthstone game which is very popular from blizzard yeah. there is a a very it almost looks like a clone of hearthstone with like a little bit different artwork yeah. and now that is uh, getting popular as I, i forgot the name of the game but that's getting popular as a play to earn game um uh, in the blockchain ecosystem uh, right it's called uh, uh, some infinity x infinity or something like that no x infinity is different this is a okay. that, that one is more like the actually or uh, you have pets that you're trading yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. etc etc right but this one is a pure play okay. kind of a rip off of okay. Hearthstone, okay. which is just okay. a card trading game right okay okay you're battling yeah. with these cards kind of thing sure sure but but i think i completely agree that the maturity is not yet there yes. in terms of the depth of the game projects yeah. itself yeah. right like yeah. they're just saying Okay, this game is popular in the regular gaming world. Let's take a clone version yeah. of it and spin it up in a slightly new sure. manner, and sure. then stack on blockchain as the selling proposition under it, right? Yeah. And that yeah. that's where it feels, at least to the gaming industry folks, it feels a little bit shallow, right? Yeah, exactly, like, exactly. Uh, I'm not, I'm not. I know this concept will work, but how sustainable the products are right now? That is my question mm-hmm. mark right now. absolutely no i think i 100% agree and i think there are a couple of good interesting nft related projects that are coming sure. out uh, totality corp in india i had uh, uh, the founder back on call as well uh, some time mm-hmm. back they are launching uh, a lakshmi nft right oh, wow. uh, i i i i i saw that i saw that yeah yeah, yeah so, so there are some linkedin feed yeah <laughs> there are some kind of these interesting use cases sure. that are uh, you know conceptualized for the the ecosystem here itself yeah but but i think if you extract out like do you see a future where somewhere the esports industry and this sort of new nft space ownership and yes. uniqueness like do you see these two kind of merging what's kind of like your future Definitely. take around it that's that's the only reason i'm very looking forward to nft because see in case of uh, esports tournaments like xyz player did a, a clutch hmm. and it does that video is owned by us Hmm. because it is on our broadcast hmm. we could create an nft of that and my 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 thesis is that people would like to own that uh, nft hmm. because it's one of its kind one of its uh, yeah. rarity because in the, the best part is even if that guy does a five uh, ace in some other game it is not never the same yep. so i see that marriage of nft and uh, esports but it will be more towards the video content not hmm. really towards the static content got it yeah so i think uh, um a lot of these streamers and content creators are creating nfts out of yes. the things but now you're doing it on a tournament stage exactly in some com tournament like yeah. that's never going to be repeated right like exactly uh, exactly penta esports tournament for 2021 will always be just one tournament one exactly but so, even if that same player does another clutch it will never right. be same yeah 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 and like i mean this is same concept i don't know if the audience knows 
but uh, back in the day the game called magic the gathering was very popular mm-hmm. and i'm sure you're familiar with it as well right yeah, yeah. hearthstone <laughs> from blizzard was very much inspired, inspired from by the, magic the, the cult gathering. of yeah. magic the gathering that they was the first cards. first collector card the game exactly yeah. exactly yeah. exactly right like back in like 70s and what not yeah. so uh, people were trading these cards in physical spaces and having you know sure. these physical tournaments um where you see winners of these certain tournaments their decks are getting sold for millions right yes. like the the deck that they used in the tournament yes. so the yes. same concept can now be translated over to tournament they, winners yeah. and tournament exactly. clippings and people would love to own that stuff yeah. etc as well right? that's so, that's my take on nft where i see it them marrying and being successful yeah yeah absolutely so i think uh, from because we have a lot of developers in the community as sure. well right how do you sort of guide developers to think about making decisions in their game from a design perspective implementation perspective that are uh, that would make games more palpable for like the esports arena mm-hmm. right like mm-hmm. things that will have not just good playing value but like viewer value as well right like how do you uh, how do you suggest developers to think in that direction approach okay so let me first start with what is esports so esports is a spectator sport which uh, takes place in form of organized multiplayer video game competitions particular between players individuals or teams because certain mm-hmm. games like hearthstone is player based and uh, games like valorant or bgmi are teams based so that's that's the core definition of esports with the focus that it it is watchable okay mm-hmm. so what makes game and esports title first is it must be watchable there should be a spectator mode inside the game that is a first and the most important aspect which converts between a normal game and a esports title hmm. second point is that game should be balanced uh, which means that you need to have a very strong uh, uh, your live ops team because with the only reason i'll give an example of uh, league of legends from riot because hmm. that's that's uh, pedigree i come from that game one game has i have not seen any other game or maybe couple of other games who have survived them for 10 years that game has been available in in its core yeah. form for last 10 years mm-hmm. it was 10 years back called league of legends is still called league of legends yep. with no change no version no patch nothing like that but they come out with patch every two weeks because of which mm-hmm. some things get broken mm-hmm. so they have their whole team to work on the balancing of the game they had a new character they had new uh, power so some characters become overpowered then they have to tweak them down or make somebody else more powerful to uh, look at yeah. that so the game must be balanced so you have to maintain the balance between them third uh, aspect is you have to have mad skill so the uh, uh, the cap between a starting uh, guy who starts that game and the guy who has maybe played 2000 or 10000 hours that skill gap should be there that mm-hmm. is the only reason why lot of games like ludo etc are not considered uh, esports yeah. there's no skill gap it's all mm-hmm. luck based Correct. fourth is uh, basically there should be no pay to win mechanics mm-hmm. uh, matlab you you can't pay money to make your character powerful uh, generally if you look at all esports title basically they use in app currency or real money for people to buy cosmetics only maybe they are skins for the characters maybe they are characters because you can either buy the characters or grind that characters depending on your choice but if you don't want to buy the characters you can grind for that characters and third is uh, skins of weapons so these are this is only real money available use available for any uh, esports title mm. one another point is that all uh, players start at the same level when the match starts so if you take example of league of legends Yeah. Uh, or Dota, or Pokemon Unite. I don't. I don't want to be looked at as a Riot only guy, so I'm mentioning other <laughs> games. So basically, if you look at all the mobas, when the game starts, everybody starts at level one, and there's limits for level. I think for uh, uh, Pokemon Unite, it's level fifteen. For League of Legends, it's po- uh, level sixteen. Hmm. But that's the max level. But once you finish that game and you start the next game, you start at level one. so there's no disparity inside the game your level might be anything but when you start the batch you are always at level 1 only 
and on the other aspect games like uh, fps games cs go valorant even hmm. uh, battle royale games like pubg or uh, fortnite or uh, uh, bgi uh, bgmi uh, and even free fire there's no requirement of level it's just you jumping showing your skills and you getting out so yeah. all players have the same uh, uh, level when they start and the last more most important part for any title to become esports title is that developer need to support that game as a esports title i think that is the major difference which i see in the industry today lot of people claim their titles to be esports but the support all the functions that i've talked about they don't they have they don't have them inside the game and 90% of international developers basically use esports as their marketing uh, model only they yeah. are not there to make revenue from esports they rather rather sink their money as a marketing cost for doing that esports uh, huge tournaments absolutely oh. i think this was a very fantastic list that you shared and i can like i hope somebody noted down all the points anyways if the recording is there so you guys should definitely revisit these uh five to seven points that anurag just mentioned because i can guarantee you that this is kind of like the 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 condensed summary of a game design session right like yeah. like from a designer perspective you have to think of designing these the spectator mode having like the same level to start yeah. with right every game implements it in a different way right like sure. you said valorant you jump in and there's just one level right yes. but when you look at uh, um the clash royale the yeah. mobile ecosystem irrespective of what your level is everybody plays level 9 so they're yes. fixed some exactly. level exactly. internally in the game you can have a minimum level of 1 maximum level of 13 but then the game and the team said that we'll fix it at level 9 so that way it brings the level playing field to all kind of tournaments etc as well right so i think um, like this overall list i'm i'm amazed right like you can actually take this list apply it to every popular esport game and you'll see the remnants of each and every point sort of being ticked off saying okay yeah. does it have spectator mode yes does it have this leveling system where everybody starts at the same level yes does it have a play to win kind of a mechanic no right so you will see all good esports game have this so i think i exactly. think this was really really uh, you know uh, great what you just shared i think it was very important um so but it sort of begs one question which is do you think that every esports title should have all of these to no. begin with or do you think there's like a graduation period that you can start with some and have others as add-ons that's okay. coming later a couple of things are very important without them uh, you can't call it title esports title mm-hmm. you have to have a spectator mode no matter what that you have to have that secondly it should not be pay to win mechanics because then it's not being on the same uh, yeah. level yeah. ground uh, third is uh, uh, your uh, stuff like uh, one sec here uh skill gap skill hmm. gap you can still you matlab that's not something you need to build uh, day one but it's good to have hmm. then uh, the the developer sport that has to be there and the game must be balanced that is the most important aspect hmm. apart from uh, being a spectator mode available i think that is the most important the game needs to be balanced yeah yeah i think you mentioned regarding this game balancing thing something called as live ops yeah. majority people actually don't understand okay. but just entering the industry what live ops really sure. means so maybe if you can take 2 minutes just to sure. broaden the audience knowledge base in terms of what exactly live ops is how does that play a critical role in these games that we play tournaments in every other day but we don't realize the magic that's happening behind the screens yeah. so guys it's generally the ceos and the game designers who are in the front the face of the product but there are at least 10x or 30x depending on the game people behind the scene and those are live ops guy they are the most critical part who these live ops means people who make game up and running and keep it balanced so one though there are couple of aspects of live ops but the aspect which is more relevant here so generally games bring new characters gets new patch trust me gaming is lives on morphis law that if something can uh, break it will break it will break so yeah. that's that's what that's how gaming industry is like murphy law is part of our, our every everyday yeah. life so you need people to fix that immediately first identify the 
thing which got broken because a new character was uh, released or a new patch was released or a, some power was changed and then you need to fix it that is the whole purpose of live ops if you really ask me apart from keeping the game up keeping the servers up and running everything like that but from the game design perspective that is the most critical job of uh, live ops yeah and and you would need like every kind of talent imaginable yes. people who are thinking around how to balance the game from a design perspective people yeah. who are helping manage the servers as well people who are creating new characters new sure. skins yeah. new uh, animations uh, programmers who are implementing new kind of features etc so all of this kind of continues to happen so so today for you know good the industry has evolved into this sort of living breathing monster where games they don't get shipped once on a disc and then it's done yeah <laughs> but, but now it's like a continuous evolution of process where every two weeks you have a new release yes. where some new content is going out some new yeah. tournament is coming up etc so for all of that uh, from programming side from design side from art side from uh, production side from animations all of these needs to come together in order to make that happen um exactly. one interesting story i'll share here quickly um in in my previous days that i was with the uh, dena and we were working on transformers game mm -hmm. um we launched it in beta to australia and new zealand before mm -hmm. we actually did the live launch for the us audience okay. we knew that the mom this was coming out in 2014 along with the transformers movie so we were mm -hmm. working on the official transformers game and hasbro was launching the official movie as well at the same time and both were supposed to launch within the same week same week yeah uh, so two weeks before the official launch we did a small soft launch in australia mm -hmm. and suddenly our server started to melt literally two oh. hours after launch and we okay. were like what the hell happened <laughs> right like australia we don't expect that much traffic to exactly come from. there's no that's the reason you do it in places exactly. like australia See, countries like australia and new zealand yeah. which has a similar paying capacity as customers in us but you don't get flurry of traffic and you can test things out as well yeah. what we realized was like somebody had hacked the apk uh, oh. from the android store and now it was getting distributed in china like crazy <laughs> and and all these requests that were getting bombarded on the servers were coming from china oh wow oh like, wow literally it was like in app currency the coins that we were giving when you start a new account you get like 100 coins for free sure. and then you start playing and collecting sure. etc sure. right sure every account was saying they had like a million coins on day one wow <laughs> and our server wow. was blocking that this is an invalid request invalid request invalid request like every second we were getting like hundreds of these requests hitting the server and suddenly our server was like not responding to actual players in australia exactly because you also had a ddos attack because of exactly. this exactly yep yep so so it's like live ops means you have to handle these situations on the fly in order for the players experience to not go down and and with games being now global and 24/7 this poses a lot of engineering challenge right how do you keep these things running because if anurag you're hosting a tournament in india time uh for pubg or something somebody else is hosting it in korea time somebody yeah. else is hosting in us time and and shit can go wrong anywhere Right. Anyway, anyway. So, so that's something also like, uh, very important. Just sharing with you, like so we as a tournament operator, though we work very closely with publishers, we get their approvals, keep them updated. But something messes up at publisher side, and uh, they have to mm. take a maintenance break, knowing that our tournament is happening. <laughs> yeah. We have to, we have to account in our planning the whole that there could be one or two days of outage from the publisher itself. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. no i think these are the kind of things that good engineering teams will try and anticipate and have like systems in place to have yeah. fallback mechanisms yes. as well right yes. how do you if something breaks the moment you put a new patch up or a new build up how do you quickly roll back so at least players can continue playing yes. till you figure out and and then make another exactly. launch as well right so yeah. there are these kind of again this is all sort of slightly more engineering focused thing but yes. but all the things that that gaming industry still need to very realistically take care yes. of as well so yeah like most of publisher if you see their approach is player first like the anything they do they will take losses but they want to since they want to retain their player base they will do things in interest of the players absolutely i think that's a very good point that you just raised right player first that yeah. mentality if it's there in everybody in the team 
Okay. You have to think of player as the first person in mind. If I'm implementing something this way, if I'm designing yes. something this way, if this animation is supposed to be this way. You have to think player first, right? Like Agreed. it's a very fundamental thing, but we often but, forget but because we get the, into the complexities. The only only company whose official statement is player first is right. That's where I learned the this term, mm. and mm. that's what I tell everybody that whenever you are designing a game, you should not design the game which appeals to you. You have to design a game which appeals to your audiences. It, you might love the game, but yeah. that doesn't make that game successful. Once your audiences love it, of course, it has to be ma- ma- marriage of both. What you love, you will excel at that, creating yeah. that. But yeah. the whole aspect is that the audience should, your player base should love that game, not just you. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's actually very true like we always keep talking about from a career perspective find things that you are passionate about yes but in gaming you have to build things that your player base is passionate exactly. about right exactly like, hopefully it's the same thing that you are yeah. passionate about and the player yeah. that's the perfect marriage then right true. um good awesome i think the roop has an interesting question abhishek i'll come back to your question as well but uh so roop is asking how do you think about creating hype uh, to get a lot of players because esports is nothing but more of events, right? So you have sure. to get a lot of people together. Um, there's a lot of marketing effort that goes behind the scenes as well. So maybe if you can walk us through what really happens behind the scenes in terms of esports, conducting tournaments, the challenges that you might face on a day-to-day basis from a company perspective and sure. things like that as well. So uh, the one challenge which we have faced, but that was a known devil which we were, that we are using a platform for registration and showing everything. Whereas mm-hmm. in India, people are so used to using Google uh, Forms to do all the registration. So that is a challenge. I admit it in public, but we were aware of this challenge when we launched because we wanted to become very smooth for players in the journey. We are not here only for a short term. Mm-hmm. Whenever I get into something, it's only once my target is done for that. I always set a milestone. So my milestone for this company is that I want parents to ask their kids, have you studied for four hours? If they say yes, I want them to ask, have you practiced your game for two hours? That's the time <laughs> I will retire from this industry. So those are the those are the kind of un, unrealistic milestones I keep, but that's how I am. So we want to create a long-term journey for a player where having their d- database, having them database at the central place is the most critical for us. That tomorrow when I have to reach back to them, I know who those guys are. I know what games they like. Mm-hmm. So when we are doing a tournament, of course, we market the product, the tournament or the event to all the people, but special focus is on those players wh- whom I know like this game, whether they are viewers, whether they are players. Mm-hmm. That's number one. Number two is basically, if you look at right now in India, if you look at the pyramid for esports, which is very top heavy, in terms mm. of everything we do for esports, when I say top heavy, it means it's all catered towards uh, professional esports. Mm. Whether it's the tournaments, whether it's a platform, whether it's a content, we want to change it. I want to work at the bottom part of the pyramid, which is a huge pyramid, but so is the problems because you have to now address to not just the hundred teams but thousand teams which are in that pyramid. Mm. We we again, it's a challenge we have taken, so we are addressing that. So. That is our second strategy that we, that's the reason why we have created a league only for amateurs and semi-pros where professional players and teams are not allowed to participate. Mm-hmm. So, so that is, many- that is, yeah, that is, that is the best way we have figured out. That is the reason where we get so many participation because one thing coming out from this amateur league is that even the pro teams are looking at talent from this uh, league to be mm-hmm. hired in them. So it's yeah. not just the price pool. Of course, the price pool, if you look, is almost equivalent to third-party tier one events. Mm-hmm. Okay, but that is not that's not just one time where if a guy wants to make a career in esports, athlete, we are also giving him opportunity to be absorbed by a recognized uh, esports uh, organization. So right. I think with all this put together is how we are attracting the players. Hmm, okay, and like, normally here, like, uh, are you seeing this as a as a as a business structure to say that we are gonna find and this like in a classical sort of sports analog- analogy, right? Like, football has 
uh, the scouts kind of a program, right? Like you have these junior leagues and then you have these intermediate yeah. leagues and then you have the actual tier one leagues itself, right? So are you imagining something like that as a system where so, where you're acting as a, uh, as a search and discovery platform yes. for a lot of the bigger organizations to find young budding talent in the esports arena? So giving you the analogy, which I have always gave for cricket, we are the Ranji Cup. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that that becomes easier because I, I, I at one time I was a big cricket fan. So that is the analogy I always gave that we are the Ranji Cup, but but we are not only the Ranji Cup to create the journey for esports player. Mm. Our focus is on the grassroots uh, events only. Mm. So 90% or 80% of our efforts are going on grassroots, but we are doing also uh, the whole journey for esports player. So we the people who win from our uh, grassroots leagues are invited into our professional league uh, tournament, which happens uh, like MHL league happens across the year for 10 months. Whereas there's only twice we'll do professional league, which is invite only. Mm. So invite only where the top teams from the country would be invited and winners of our grassroots event will be invited. So that is for India level. The, plus we are also talking to the publishers where the winner of our professional league would also be accept, would be invited into the regional league by that publisher. Hmm. So we are trying to create the whole ecosystem and journey for the esports athlete. Hmm. Got it. Now, I think this is very interesting and I can see a lot of parallels because just a couple of days ago, I posted this uh, poll on LinkedIn asking mm -hmm. if you, folks would be interested in learning about game entrepreneurship. Yeah, uh, okay. and we got like 500 votes out of it in wow. just like two days. Uh, wow. 79 percent or something would have said yes, saying yes. <laughs> right? So, I think at the very grassroots level, there's a lot more excitement and sure. people taking more control of their career. I mean, I see an esports player as an entrepreneur because they are also trying to do something sure. outside the regular nine exactly. to five job ecosystem, exactly. Right? Um, and 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 there's a strong parallel that I see from, from what you just said and what was kind of going in my head yeah. regarding game entrepreneurship. And can you build that structure up where you empower more people with this knowledge and, and infrastructure so that they can decide for themselves whether they want to build a career in this space as well? Or not? Agreed. I completely agree with you. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Awesome. But I think there was one question that I missed. So I'll just pick that up now. Um, how would you suggest like, you know, developers stay on top of this ever evolving kind of a field because things are changing so fast right like it feels like blockchain just came out of absolutely nowhere even yeah. though that's not yep. the case there were a lot of projects that were like old five years old six years old as well but at least mainstream um, blockchain gaming and yeah. play and earn kind of ecosystem they came out of nowhere so how do you recommend people to stay on top of stuff i think, that's I think right now things are much easier because i started my gaming career in 99 where internet was i think uh, uh, 5,000 rupees for 200 hours or something, VSNL connection, where yeah. daily I remember there are only two telephone incoming telephone lines. So yeah. if you get the connected, you will never leave it. That, yeah. That's the time I'm coming from. So even right now, I spend close to two to three hours every night at my time reading what's happening in the world on internet. That, mm -hmm. that's, that is my only recommendation. I am, I am very against people doing courses of game design and game development mm. and claiming them to be a game developer. I am totally against that. And I have a very simple reasoning. Mm. I could be wrong in that, that if you look at our Indian ecosystem, when we say a guy is doing a game development course, mm. he's being made jack of all trades, mm. not a specialist in one. Yep. That is my complaint against our education mm. system, the gaming oh, education yeah. system, not today for last 25 years. I've been yeah. telling all whether I will not name them, but you pick up any uh, game uh, development or animation or whatever. <laughs> like even you, they say, oh, I'm an animator. I'm very clear. You are an animator. Good. But are you a low poly animator or high poly animator? Are you a rigger or what? They say, I'm an animator. I said, yeah, I don't need an animator. I need a rigger. I need a high poly uh, modeler yeah. or something. I want a specialist. Right. I, I don't want journalists. And I've been telling to all this academic uh, schools or whatever you want to mm, call them mm. that if you want to do something good for these kids, please make, of course, you have to run through them all the generic courses, but as an output, they should be specialists yeah. based on their yeah. liking. Yep. Yep. I think uh, 
uh, the T skill set is something that I personally love that analogy where you should know 20% of other things because it's a collaborative space, yes. but you should be 80% mastered in one. Exactly. Yeah. So, exactly. so that's exactly the mentality that we follow and something that I talk about a lot in our Perfect. internal student discussions. That yeah. make sure that you pick one. Your specialization will change over time as your course, career matures. Of course, of but course. you should know that you're specializing in one, right? It will start off as programming. I, you can go into AI programming. You can go exactly, into animation. Yeah. And then you can go into 2D animation, 3D animation. And then even further down specifically, right? I know people who are uh, doing like combat 3D animation. Right, Perfect. they only work on just combat animation. Those that, are the right? people. Those are the people that Indian industry needs. Correct. We yeah. don't need animators. Yeah, we need animators who are specific for to one area. Of course, their specialization can change with the time. Correct. But at when you when you are applying to a company, you should be very clear what you are. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So over time, the T shape changes, but it still yep. remains like T. You exactly. know, a lot of other things, but only 20% of those so that you can talk to because it is a collaborative industry. At yes. the end of the day, yes. you have to talk to designers every day. You have to talk to artists yes. to get your job done as well. Yeah. Um, so you know, need to know the 20% no, yes. of everything else, yeah. but you should master at least one, exactly. right? Like that one thing that you are mastering has to have at least 80% depth in it so that you can call yourself you know, a confident X, whether it's a yeah. programmer, a developer, designer, whatever that might be. So, yeah. One more, one more thing I like to add here. Like a lot of time I talk to people, they say, oh, uh, when they to, uh, tell their skill sets, they say, I'm a uh, uh, Maya animator. I'm like, listen, mm. you, you, you as long as you're an animator, that's what I want. Don't give me the name of the tool. Uh, yeah. tool name. Yep. Yep, exactly. That's one more thing I would recommend. Matlab, you switching from one tool to another tool is one month job, no matter what. Even that's exactly. true for programming languages. Your 100%. fundamental needs to be clear. Exactly. Your syntaxes can change, man. Yep, yep. No, I love it. Exactly, right? Like fundamentals is the key thing. You yes. master that, you focus yes. on that. That's why people like come and ask like, are you teaching Unreal? Are you doing this? Are, yeah, just focus on one thing, really yes. master it. You'll be able to transfer that knowledge exactly. into something else very exactly. easily, right? But making sure that you're able to really go deep and talk about intelligently what you have learned in yes. that one thing, yes. right? you'll get ample career opportunities, even some, something else, because they companies look at and think that, yes, they understand fundamentals. They no. have solid sound reasoning and logic. That's what yes. people look at today. That's, that's what that's what game development is all about, man. Exactly. It's always, <laughs> always going beyond your boundaries and deliver the product. Yep, absolutely, hundred percent agree. And then that player first attitude, right? Yes. Player first. <laughs> awesome. So I think this is really interesting, and and I know we overshot the window time window a little bit as well. So uh, my apologies there, but uh, oh, it was really man. really insightful having you on and and talking a lot about the sports man. industry and a lot more broader as well. So um, would maybe love to host you again in six months or something time in the future as well. I'm available for such kind of sessions. I'm always available. I'm very clear. If anybody even one one of my suggestions works for them. It's made my day. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. So if anybody wants to follow your journey or follow Penta Esports, etc., where should they go? Um, like if you can share some uh, details, maybe Piyush can share it with the audience as well. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll so send it to Piyush. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So Piyush can take care of sending it to everybody as well. And you guys can follow Anurag's journey as well. And, and hopefully uh, watch some Penta Esports tournaments as well and, and share whatever feedback you might have with Anurag. Yeah. Perfect, right? Awesome. Thanks, Anurag. Uh, Thanks, for, man. You know, taking out really, the really, really, really love here. being here, man. Yeah, perfect. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Uh, guys, I think just stay back. Uh, Piyush had some one announcement to make for everybody. So we'll just do that in a minute. Awesome. Piyush. Um, Hello. And a half on. Yep. 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 Totally. Am I audible? Yes, I can hear you, but I can't see you because I think you are have me on pin. <clears throat> okay, wait. Can you see me now? Yeah. Wait. Okay. Wait. So, uh, I guess we almost have uh, 21 participants here and minus team around 15 17 people from the clan so uh, we have waited very long for this thing like you know uh, today 
uh, I, I'm just announcing about the outscale swags that we are going to give out to all the students, like all the clan members. And uh, like I've been personally waiting for outscale swags for very long, like at least everyone in the team was waiting for a very long time. And uh, since our clan members are the exclusive part of our community, so, uh, you know, it's a token of love from our info, everyone. So I'll be just circulating a form here plus on the Discord server. So probably I'll do it on Discord server itself. This, uh, like, since the event will end, like, in two minutes, it will disappear from here. So I'll drop an announcement on the Discord server. So all you have to do is just fill that form with all your details of uh, address, state, city, and all with your mobile number where delivery boy can uh, connect with you and all. So we'll be sending out a gift hamper to all of our clan members and uh, <clears throat> for everyone from clan one to clan 90. So yeah, majorly that, yeah, that exactly. was the announcement. I think this was, was like a long project in the works. It was just kind of dropped on me uh, for a while, but uh, but I'm glad we are finally getting around to it. So, so you guys will get to... Uh, in the like actually this is happening for the first time in the history of our scale itself so folks who have recently joined with us you guys are lucky that you're getting to see this but people from like literally 2018 still haven't seen any kind of outscale goodies um yep. so i'm excited to you know share this with you guys as well so uh perfect i think uh just look out for Pierce message Pierce, probably we can send out an email as well if somebody misses out the message on discord so let's yeah, push yeah. it out on both discord and email yep okay. yep so that was fun and there's another announcement about the good number of events that we are planning in the month of february so those who are you know part of the community for a really long time now they might have noticed that you know we are going a little aggressive with the events from past few weeks so this is going to get more aggressive so since all of you have your uh, you know clan uh, sessions and everything going on please try to take out time for these sessions as well we'll try to bring in a lot of industry experts like these and uh, now since we are diving into the web3 ecosystem as well so in the month of february you will see a lot of big names big people industry experts from the web3 and uh, gaming industry coming in for sessions my uncle will be hosting them and apart from this like we also have a lot of other events planned where you guys will be you know participating hands-on and some sessions will be like these where you just sit and absorb the information some will be more hands-on where you will be the key participant in that so yeah like the community team is working very hard to bring in such people and just you know uh, keep your eyes on the clan announcement channel and also there's that event section on the top of the, uh, on top left corner of our Discord server. So all the events that we have, the upcoming events, you'll see them listed. So um, for now, like there are two events already scheduled. One that's happening on 4th of February with Web of Jawan, uh, and another event that is happening with uh, Malar on Sunday, streaming uh, Sunday. That's all. Perfect. So I think um, I'll just add one more thing here for events. If you guys have suggestions and you would like to see us uh, bring somebody in for a talk, please do recommend, right? Uh, because we're always looking for people who can share their knowledge and wisdom with you guys as well. And we get to learn something along the way. So um, if you have recommendations, just share it with Piyush on DM as well. Um, any, like, don't even think about uh, whether we can reach that person or not. Uh, if they are in the industry in some shape or form and they're excited about sharing and spending a little bit, even half an hour time with the community, um, we'll get them. So, so just share your recommendations for speakers that you would like us to uh, bring in as well. Uh, at the end of the day, this is for the community as well. So at the end of the day, if you guys suggest who you want to hear, what kind of topics you want to hear on, things like that, that'll always help us. Uh, bring more relevant folks into the ecosystem as well right so yeah i think that's it um so that that's it for today thanks again for everybody joining in uh, hopefully you guys learned something if however it was the session just feel free to share some feedback with Piyush as well um and um you know whether you liked it didn't like it it was slightly different from our regular session if you would have noticed this was more esports focused like regularly we bring in a lot of more tech focused people um, so uh, like one of the goal is to 
broaden the understanding of the people in the community because i know a lot of you guys reach out to me asking regarding starting game studios and things like that as well business there's a lot of business related questions in clan labs so that's why i want to bring in a diverse audience so that you are all well informed in terms of what's happening overall in the not just in the country but even on the global scale as well right so uh, please do recommend uh, anyone that you can think of uh, that we should bring in uh, and we'll try to make that happen as well okay Perfect. I think uh, we'll jump off uh, and uh, yeah, I'll see you guys back in Discord as well. Right. Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye bye.